who's a good girl? Who's a good Belladonna? Oh, I get a good girl. Oh, okay. You want to help me make a video today? <laughs> you want to help me make a video? Huh? Welcome to my channel on the best of fantasy. This is the week that was. Or perhaps in this case, I should say, these are the weeks that were, because I missed a week last week, got a little bit busy at work, and I knew that would happen from time to time, now that I am the interim department chairperson. So yeah, I got a little busier than normal, and just decided I was too tired to record the episode last week, but here I am back at it. And uh, I, I get to talk about two weeks of uh, fun in this case then. So uh, what did I do on the channel in the last couple of weeks? Well, I did the 25 questions tag. I had been tagged by Alan from the library of Alexandria, and it was a, a lot of fun to do that tag. And a lot of, I guess it was sort of going around and I saw a lot of people's uh, 25 questions tag videos going around and I tagged a few people so I do hope to see them do th their version of the tag as well. It was a lot of fun. Uh, some slightly more personal questions I guess uh, for the 25 questions tag but that's that's part of the fun here on booktube is getting to know each other. So that's uh, definitely something that's been uh, very meaningful for me actually is getting to know people and become becoming friends with people. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, too. What else did I do? Uh, well, I had a fantastic time talking with my friend A.P. Canavan from A Critical Dragon about working with an editor because he has, in fact, edited my first two books. He has given me some wonderful suggestions on the first two books of my fantasy trilogy that I've been working on for years and years and years, and it's really quite a wonderful thing to work with somebody like AP. He is a professional. He has a very fine critical eye. He, you know, he knows what he's doing and um, he's a brilliant observer of narrative integrity in storytelling and especially of course in fantasy, his specialty. But I found that I had written uh, these books over the course of years and I pretty much had gotten to a point where I felt like I don't think I can make these any better. And then somebody like AP comes along and <laughs> he makes all these suggestions and I'm thinking, why didn't I see that, you know? Uh, and I, you know, it's not that I, I actually do every single thing he suggests. I, there are a couple here and there that I, that I ignore, but for the most part, I, I think he has incredible insights. And uh, I'm so happy because I really feel like he has helped me to make the stories much better. And, and I'm in the process now of revising book two, following his suggestions, going a bit slower than I would like because once again, I'm very busy at work, but yeah, it's okay, it is coming along. And I am very optimistic about uh, the, uh, the chances of these books out on the marketplace. We shall see though. So yeah, I had a great time talking with AP though, um, and uh, he is a little reluctant to talk about what he does as an editor um, because he is professional and he doesn't normally talk about the specifics of how he helps particular authors, but we, we kept it pretty general and I gave a few nice examples, I think, of ways in which he helped me, and there are so many others that I hope to talk about more with him someday. I'd like to have some more conversations with AP uh, especially if the books do get published. Uh, it would be really fun to uh, have some uh, analytical discussions with him about what I was up to when I was writing the books. And, and, uh, and I'm not shy about talking about ways in which he's helped me to make them better as well. So, yeah. So that was a lot of fun and a very meaningful discussion for me. And I think a lot of the people who left comments uh, left similar... Uh, sentiments in that I think this was a conversation that really was uh, meaningful for a lot of people. Not only was it enlightening in terms of how books get produced, but I think it was a way for people to see the importance of the relationship between author and editor. It's really uh, a fine example of teamwork and uh, ways in which creativity happens so much more when you're working with someone else, that your ideas, you kind of bounce ideas off of each other. And that is a way in which uh, creativity 
absolutely burgeons and, and it makes uh, the, it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun to work with another person on your ideas and to get those creative ideas out there. So yeah, that was another great aspect of that that we touched on a bit, I think, in the video. So what else did I do? I made a video about series that I will finish in 2022 and series that I will continue and series that I will start this year. And that was a lot of fun for me. Snuck in a couple Monty Python references there, which I think most people got. <laughs> And uh, it, it's a lot of fun to actually think about. I'm like a kid in a candy store, like pretty much everybody else on BookTube, thinking about, okay, what am I going to read next? And it's a bit of a problem, to be frankly, because there are so many series that I do want to read. And I know that all of them will not fit into the year 2022. Uh, but uh, So I left some things out that I... I very, very much want to read, um, like Gene Wolfe's uh, series, Book of the New Sun. I mean, that's one I definitely want to read, but I didn't put it in the video. I don't have a copy of the book yet. I have other books that I bought that I need to get through. So this is a fairly common problem on BookTube. <laughs> so I think it's, it's fine to dream big, but also I think it's good to try to organize oneself. I'm somewhere in the middle. Some people are super organized and they've absolutely planned out all the books they're gonna read and they stick to that schedule. That's fairly rare, I think. And on the other end, there are people who just, I don't even try to do TBRs. <laughs> and then I'm somewhere in the middle where I, yeah, I make an attempt and I have these aspirational TBRs that I talk about every season, uh, so four times a year. And uh, I so far have failed every single time to uh, deliver on those aspirational TBRs. But, you know, I, I, that's okay with me because I end up reading a lot of great books. And so you, you try for this much and you do this much and it's, it's okay, right? So, yeah, I think uh, I will continue to do those aspirational TBRs. But uh, it was a lot of fun to talk about the series that I had. And I, there are some that I know I'm going to finish. Uh, Malazan being, of course, uh, the, the two Malazan series. I, I know they're going to be done. Dark Tower I'm going to prioritize. And because I'm in a, in a buddy read, I'm definitely going to be finishing the Long Price Quartet. So, yeah. And uh, speaking of things Malazan, I also put out a video uh, that was a discussion of Blood and Bone. This is book five of... Novels of the Malazan Empire by Ian C. Esselmont. This was a discussion that I had with AP from A Critical Dragon. And we also recorded a spoiler-filled video that has not yet come out. I anticipate that that will be coming out fairly soon. Uh, but it was such a great time talking with AP about book five of Novels of the Malazan Empire. What a setting. Wow. I, I think it is probably one of the most... Uh, iconic settings in a fantasy I've ever read. It is one of the, it, you just, it's, it's so sticks in your mind, what Esselmont conjured up, what he evoked in Blood and Bone is, was just an incredible. The guy is, I mean, he is so good at atmosphere and setting. And there were some new Malazan characters in that book that I really enjoyed uh, a lot. Uh, like, you know, Merc and Sour, one of the, the great Malazan duos. Um, but yeah, I mean, and he hits on some of the major Malazan themes as well. The, the individual's relationship with the bigger world around the individual, the, the people, the, the, the forms of life, the cosmos. Uh, there's some big stuff in Malazan, folks, along with some incredible fun storytelling, great humor, um, and just wow. And the horror element in Blood and Bone is, I think... Maybe. I mean, there are some moments, yeah, in Memories of Ice, perhaps, uh, and certainly in uh, Night of Knives, but I think I'm going to put forward Blood and Bone as the most horrorful <laughs> Malazan book of all. I mean, it was really quite atmospheric, um, very effectively done, so I enjoyed that one a lot. And of course, always talking with AP about a Malazan book, what a treat. I mean, I just, I, I it, helps me to appreciate the books that much more. It makes it even more fun to read these books, knowing that I'm going to talk with AP about it and learn more. And uh, 
and uh, have new insights and perspectives on these books. And that's why we're here. That is why we're all here. So I enjoyed that a lot. And I also had some fun with some people on their channels. I was involved uh, nearly two weeks ago now uh, in a, a spoiler-filled chat on Toll the Hounds, book eight of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, with Jimmy and Joanna on Jimmy's channel, The Fantasy Network. And I've been in quite a few of, of Jimmy's Malazan chats at this point, and it has been a lot of fun. I've remarked on just how wonderful it is to, to learn from his perspective, and Joanna's, and so many others. And Alan has been in a lot of those as well. And so that was a lot of fun. Uh, the, the Toll the Hounds, um, this time around, uh, when I read Toll the Hounds, it hit me much harder than the first time. And the first time was really something. It really was. But there was just so much I was trying to figure out that I think I was reading it more here than here. And this time, whoa, boom, it, it hit me so hard. Um, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful book about love and grief and, and life. Um, and it's just a, a, a fantastic, like every Malazan book, a reflection of the human experience. So it was wonderful to talk with uh, my fellow booktubers on that. I was also involved, I mentioned Long Price Quartet already, I was involved in a discussion on book two of the Long Price Quartet, A Betrayal in Winter, and that is of course by Daniel Abraham, and this uh, discussion took place on Nico's channel, Nico's Book Reviews. Lots of fun. That's a great group that I'm with, and that includes, of course, Nico, but also Andrew from Andrew's Wizardly Reads, and Sarah from Sarah Reads, and Alan from the Library of Alexandria. And we will be joined by Zara. I had been talking about Zara from Books with Zara joining us before, but there was some kind of miscommunication, uh, so she was not able to join us for A Betraying Winter, but I hope very much that she will be with us for the next discussion on Book 3 which is uh, something about fall. An autumn war. An autumn war is book three. So, Zara, I hope we'll, you will be joining us for that one. And that is going to be on Sarah's channel, Sarah Reads. And I anticipate that will be mid to late February when we all get together. So, yeah. But that was a lot of fun. Uh, Betrayal in Winter. Fantastic book. I liked it even more than A Shadow in Summer, book one. And I anticipate that I will continue to really be impressed with Daniel Abraham's writing. Um, he is a great character writer with lots of insights into human nature, especially in the context of human relationships. He really brings out some complexity in his characters through their relationships, a lot of conflict in terms of how they view one another and how they feel about one another, the various emotions that come into play. So, yeah, great writer, and I'm, in, I'm really happy that I've started reading um, some of Daniel Abraham's books. There's so many authors that I want to get to, but he was definitely one, and I'm glad to be here. So, yeah. And what do I have coming up? Well, I am currently reading Dust of Dreams. I have started book nine of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is what I'm reading right now, folks. I know what's in this book. I've read it before, but wow. Um, it's, uh, I know this is going to be an incredible, incredible read for me um, because I remember just how amazing it was to read books nine and ten last time. And I anticipate that uh, on this second read, this reread, it's going to be, uh, I'm just. I've been blown away by this whole Malazan experience. It is the biggest thing that's happened on my channel. Uh, and I am anticipating a really significant ending to all of this. <laughs> so there'll be lots to celebrate, lots of discussions to come. Fortunately, there's, these are such rich books that I'm, I'm pretty sure that AP and I are going to have a lot of chats. Uh, not just uh, a spoiler-free and a spoiler-filled one, but we'll probably do a poem or two. Uh, there's one poem in particular that AP and I are definitely going to do from Dust of Dreams, and this is at uh, Steven Erickson's suggestion. So uh, I am very excited to take a look at this poem, and I hope that, uh, that people will tune in for that because I think that this is a very important poem, not just for the Malazan Book of the Fallen, but for Steven Erickson and, and what he is all about as an author. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to be a great discussion. Uh, but I hope uh, that uh, AP and I will have the 
incredible opportunity to talk to both authors, to Steven Erickson and Ian Esselmine. We'll see. Uh, we'll try to schedule that um, as we get closer to the end. Uh, so yeah, lots of exciting things to come there. Uh, I will be reading after Dust of Dreams. I got to keep up with my Long Price Quartet read along. So I am going to be reading An Autumn War most likely after that. And as I said before, the next chat is going to be on Sarah's channel. Sarah reads, and then I'll probably go right into The Crippled God after that, because I don't think I'm going to want to wait very long uh, between Dust of Dreams and The Crippled God. I want to get right off to, onto uh, The Crippled God. And I'll also be squeezing in a, a Beowulf read, and reread in my case. I've read Beowulf I don't even know how many times. <laughs> I really don't. I have no idea how many times I've read Beowulf. But uh, it is my favorite thing to teach, and it is very exciting to me that I'm going to have a chance to talk about Beowulf with Mike from Mike's Book Reviews, and he and I are going to be reading the Tolkien translation. In fact, he's already started reading, so he's doing it at like 100 or 200 lines at a time, I think, which is a great way to read the poem, it's a great way to digest what's going on there. And I hope that when I talk to Mike, I will be able to help people who were traumatized by being forced to read Beowulf in high school and not enjoying the experience. I hope that that is something that, that can happen, that, that uh, as a result of this discussion, people will appreciate the poem maybe a little more. That would be fantastic. That would be one of my greatest accomplishments on booktube if i can manage just a few, even a few people saying wow i actually like this thing now that i hated back in high school when i was forced to read it uh, because i think there's some just amazing amazing things done in that poem and it is it, it is a poem that emerges from oral formulaic tradition so there are a lot of differences in expectations in terms of what you do when you're storytelling uh, between a oral formulaic culture and a very literate culture, which is what we are now, uh, for the most part, you know. So uh, there, there are some, as I say, the expectations are different, the modes of storytelling. This results in some, I think, a little bit of dissonance, a little bit of, of uh, head scratching when it comes to reading Beowulf. Um, so something that I hope to explain a little bit when I talk to Mike and, and hopefully make Beowulf a, a little bit more... Uh, approachable for people. And it's great that we're, we are reading the Tolkien translation because I think that Tolkien has a, uh, a very keen understanding of Old English and that is something that I know he would have been uh, very um, eager to impart in his translation, the feel of the original, uh, even as he goes for something of an aesthetic uh, that matches with the aesthetic of the Old English. So it, there are so many things, so many things as a translator that you have, to, you have to decide. You know, if you do more of one thing, you lose more of another thing. And that's how it goes in, in translation. So if, if you go, for example, too aesthetic, you're going to lose some of the direct meaning. Uh, you're going to stray from the meaning of the original. If you try to replicate the alliteration, you're going to have to be a little bit creative with the word choice, you know. So, it, but you're thereby preserving the alliteration. So you're you're conveying something important about the original. So it, it's a lot of decisions. And but Tolkien was really an incredible linguist. So, uh, so I have a lot of faith in in his translation, um, which is also prose translate a prose translation. So it, that also I think makes it a little bit easier. Because if you're, if you're just sort of not trying to replicate all the aspects of the, the poetry, it gives you a little more freedom, I think, in, in delivering the meaning along with a certain aesthetic. So, well, we'll talk about all that when, uh, when we have our chat with Mike. So, what else is going on here? Uh, let's see. I will be doing a couple episodes of Dear Dr. Fantasy, and I'm very excited about that. And uh, let's see, I will be talking with Jimmy very soon, in a week or so, actually. And uh, that'll be the next, that'll be episode three of Dear Dr. Fantasy. So Jimmy from the Fantasy Network is my next guest. And I'm very excited about that because there are a lot of things that uh, Jimmy and I have in common. And uh, I think we're going to have a very exciting discussion. And I'm very excited to see where his channel is going. I think he has one of the more 
dynamic channels out there right now on BookTube, uh, and he's doing a lot of things right on his channel. And I've always thought of Jimmy as a wonderful community builder as well. Um, so he's somebody that brings people together in a very nice way, and is something that I appreciate very much. So very much looking forward to talking with him. I also am very excited to announce that I have reached out to another BookTuber, a friend, someone that I have collaborated with before, but would love to have a chance to just chat with for a while. And that is Patrick. Patrick Leo is going to be my fourth guest for Dear Dr. Fantasy. And uh, pretty sure that that discussion is gonna happen in mid-February. So I am really, really happy to be doing this series where I get to know some of my fellow booktubers a bit more. So yeah, it's gonna be Jimmy and then Patrick and then I have a whole, whole bunch of people that I want to talk to. Uh, so I almost wish I could talk to all of them at once, but uh, I think it's better if we do one at a time. So yeah, but uh, that that's exciting for February. Um, and I don't know, should I do more than one episode of Dear Doctor Fantasy a month? Should I do two a month? Is that something that people would enjoy? Uh, having these extended conversations uh, slightly more often, uh, two a month. So let me know what you think. Two a month, one a month, what would be your preference? Uh, so, uh, And uh, then finally, I also have some other chats lined up on other people's channels. So very soon, the, the, the uh, soonest is going to be with Joanna on her channel. It's going to be a Malazan discussion and including not just me, but uh, some other booktubers who have been Malazan readers. And it is kind of her debrief, I think, or one of her debriefs that she's going to be doing after finishing the series. So I'm really looking forward to talking with her and uh, my other fellow booktubers about that. And that is coming up very soon, actually. And uh, another one, another Malazan chat, in fact, with uh, Steve. And that is going to be in mid-February. Uh, so Steve and a few other booktubers, I believe, are going to be restarting with Gardens of the Moon. And I've been invited, and I'm very honored by that invitation to have a chat with them. And uh, I, I, I can't wait to hear what they all think of Gardens of the Moon. And I've also been invited by Chaz. Uh, so Chaz is going to be having me on his channel at some point in March. So that's a little bit, a little ways off, but in March I'll be appearing on Chaz's. Um, he has a, a new... Uh, show that he's starting up uh, talking with fellow booktubers. So I'm very excited to be part of that as well. So lots coming up and uh, lots of exciting things. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting through Dust of Dreams. This is, uh, wow, I mean, when I started this whole Malazan reread uh, with AP um, more than a year ago, I, I just couldn't have imagined being here now, but it is incredible that we are at the, the tail end of this journey. So I am so looking forward to talking about this with uh, those of you who want to hear what we have to say about uh, Dust of Dreams and the end of uh, the Malazan Book of the Fallen and novels of the Malazan Empire. But thank you so much for watching this, and there'll be lots more, as I said in my uh, series that I'm going to be reading video, lots more exciting reads ahead. So I am so excited to interact with all of you in these upcoming reads and videos and discussions and all of that. Until next time.